Hello, welcome to another session of our uh, series of digital pathology slide review. Uh, today's uh, content, I'd like to focus on a fairly basic topic uh, that uh, many of our residents uh, struggle with from time to time, uh, that of uh, normal endometrial biopsies. Uh, how do we handle just the routines of this uh, process? Of course, there are many reasons why endometrium can be biopsied, and there are many uh, stages at which it can be biopsied. So understanding the basics of the physiology of uh, endometrial uh, cycling in the normal uh, woman, as well as some of the variations that can look like these normal phases is very important. Um, this nice graphic here shows the uh, morphologic changes that are seen ranging from sloughing and uh, menses on through early proliferation, ovulation, secretory changes, decidualization, and so forth, as well as the hormonal changes and uh, physiologic uh, changes within with body temperature as well as uh, in the ovary. Um, it's important to know that all of these things can um, are going on at the same time and can sometimes get a little bit skewed because this is a fairly complicated process. But if we understand uh, these, these basics, uh, then that can help us as we're looking at our small piece of the endometrium uh, at some point down the road. So I'm gonna start with uh, the proliferative uh, stage uh, after menses have uh, concluded, uh, which uh, generally uh, post, uh, post uh, you know, five or six days into the cycle it begins uh, the proliferative phase, which can last uh, about two weeks. Uh, key features that should be seen at this stage are mitotic figures in the glands. And the glands tend to be quite tubular uh, with occasional coiling or minimal changes. Notice, however, that we have here the proliferative glands of stroma up here, but we have uh, still residual uh, endometrial basalis. Um, and then, of course, as we look at these glands, there's minimal dilatation or um, secretion within the lumina of these glands. So I've uh, included here uh, a sample uh, set of uh, digital slides, which I'll probably augment over time, so you can feel free to come back to these, uh, that illustrate how this may appear when you're looking at a small sample obtained uh, uh, transcervically uh, with either a biopsy curette or a pipel or some other sort of biopsy mechanism. And obviously this is uh, now disordered, jumbled, fragmented in ways that uh, the uh, intact uh, sections uh, uh, don't uh, have. And therefore this is a little bit more complicated to uh, interpret. But I think as we come in on lower power, we see, first of all, there's very minimal stromal edema. There can be some at various stages, uh, particularly as you advance further towards the secretory phase. The glands and stroma are uh, generally uh, about balanced or more prominent for the stroma. Um, and the contours of the glands are fairly round oval with minimal budding or angulation of those uh, glandular structures. Now, uh, you should also see uh, mitotic figures. And uh, these actually can oftentimes be picked out at low magnification because the mitotically active nuclei move superficially into the, towards the lumen. And so if you see a black dot here towards the lumen uh, of the uh, gland that's not around the basal uh, portion, that usually is a gland that is uh, dividing. And if we go a little bit higher in magnification, uh, you could then identify uh, that you'll have a little chromatid sticking out from some of these in various stages um, that indicate uh, mitotic activity. Occasionally, you'll find stromal mitoses as well. Um, now, once you begin to see uh, subnuclear vacuolization, uh, you should then begin to think about uh, secretory phases. And actually, in looking at this uh, biopsy sample, 
I think there were a few glands, if you come back, you could probably find a few glands where you were starting to get a little bit of clearing beneath the nuclei that would be suggestive of an early secretory phase change. It's not very prominent in here, so I still classify this as being proliferative phase uh, endometrium. So those are the key features that I look for uh, in looking at uh, this uh, kind of sample. And we'll see some of this in similar changes to some degree when we look at some of the disordered proliferative endometria uh, and compare that to what this more routine, normal proliferative uh, endometrium appears like. When we move into the secretory phase or the ovulatory phase, these glands begin to get a little bit more coiled. You will still see mitoses. And by early secretory phase, we mean day 16 to maybe 18, 17, a little bit under 18. And cytoplasmic vacuoles become uh, present, first beneath the nucleus and then uh, later migrating above the nucleus, as this is going to be the origin for the glandular secretion. Uh, in the early stages, the secretion is still scant because it's accumulating still within the cell. And the stroma will look relatively similar to that which we've seen in the uh, uh, proliferative phase. So again, looking at uh, this change on a biopsy sample, uh, we'll see here maybe a little bit more pallor to the uh, uh, um, tissue. Uh, as you see, there begins to be a little bit of edema in the stroma. Um, and in this biopsy, note here, we also have a little bit of endometrial basalis because here are these very uh, basal type glands with irregular shapes and contours. And in the basalis, you can have a few associated vessels as you see here. So we'll look here at this more typical fragment area over here and see if we can identify uh, these subnuclear uh, vacuoles. Um, oftentimes you can uh, see this at low magnification um, and some people have likened this appearance to sort of the keys on a piano. But I think as we look at uh, some of these glands here, you can see there's very nice uh, clear vacuoles beneath the nucleus under many of these cells uh, that is indicative of a secretory change. Now in some of them, it may be beginning to be above the nucleus, and we're starting to see secretion in the lumen here, a little bit of frilly proteinaceous uh, fluid. Uh, now, I mentioned that in the early stage of um, secretory phase endometrium, you can still find occasional mitotic figures. Uh, and again, they will migrate towards the lumen um, and probably this is one here. Um, they don't always show up as a dramatic uh, finding, but you'll usually find a few that are still around. And that, again, indicates that you're still in the very earliest phases of the secretory component of the cycle. Another example of this early stage of the uh, secretory uh, phase uh, here, the fragments are a little bit more intact. Um, again, we see that many of the glands are still fairly rounded and so forth. They're not coiling up. They're not particularly dilated. A little bit of secretion is present, but uh, we begin to see in some of these glands, there are subnuclear clear spaces uh, beginning to be evident. Well, not as evident as I'd hoped in this situation, but yes, I think you see here some of the glands are beginning to show that. So again, very early stage secretory phase endometrium, you'll begin to see these uh, subnuclear vacuoles and looser stroma, uh, beginnings of secretion, and still persistent mitotic figures are present. One more example, um, and of course the value of this tutorial, I think, to you primarily will be to allow you to come back and look more carefully and in detail at these uh, 
digital slides to cement in your minds uh, these features. Uh, here we see somewhat more tortuous glands, um, and here very prominently you can identify the subnuclear vacuole change. And this is sort of the, the typical piano key uh, pattern that has been described. Very prominent subnuclear vacuoles here um, in these glands. Um, at this stage, once they become this prominent, usually your mitotic activity will uh, begin to fade as this is probably more towards day 18 than day 16. Um, and as you reach that uh, stage of the early secretory phase, uh, the mitoses become much less uh, frequent, um, if identifiable at all. But uh, isn't this a, a beautiful little picture of these uh, um, very white, clear areas with the uh, uh, darker keys uh, here in the form of the nucleus and the uh, uh, luminal component of the cytoplasm? So you can see how all of these cells churning out their uh, little secretory product into the lumen would then begin to massively dilate uh, the uh, lumen of the uh, glands. And we can see, begin to see that secretion here. Now, uh, there may be other features sometimes you'll encounter here. You may encounter areas where you don't have hormonal responsiveness to the same degree. Um, and so you may see some still base, basal type or less prolif more proliferative pattern glands. But by and large, you shouldn't see more than a few days difference between different areas of the sample uh, before you would, uh, or you should see more than several days difference in terms of the cycle stage before you would uh, diagnose an asynchronous uh, pattern uh, in these cases. So as we move to the mid-secretory phase, uh, or late secretory phase of the cycle, uh, the glands become much more massively dilated. The uh, stroma is quite uh, edematous as well, and there are no longer any evidence of uh, uh, mitotic figures. And the amount of cytoplasm in the cells also begins to diminish. Um, so this is the essentially the implantation stage. Um, uh, just prior to the formation of a decidual reaction. That decidual reaction will begin to appear first around the uh, spiral arterioles, as you see here in this uh, illustration, and beneath the surface uh, as you approach the later phase of the secretory cycle, or the, or the later stage of the secretory phase of the cycle. So here are a few uh, digital slide examples. Um, and you may look at this at low magnification and say, how is this uh, mid to late? It looks very compact. The stroma is quite dark and so forth. But recognize that staining can be quite variable between laboratories and between women. Here we still see some coiling of the, of the glands, but we're beginning to see quite nice enlargement of uh, many of these glandular lumina um, and uh, a lot of uh, intraluminal secretion. Uh, as we look at the cells and lining the glands, uh, we see that there are no longer uh, the uh, prominent uh, cytoplasmic vacuoles, uh, either beneath the uh, nucleus or above the nucleus. Um, and the NC ratio has begun to shift towards uh, uh, the nucleus, so the cells are getting smaller as they play out. Now, additionally, uh, we can see some degree of early condensation around some of the uh, spiral arterioles uh, and beneath the surface. So here's an example, an area where the stroma just begins, begins to become a little less edematous and more consolidated here in the subsurface areas and around these uh, vessels. So this is the formation of the pre-decidua. Now, uh, Indicating that this is sort of late in the stage, we also may see an occasional early thrombus formation, uh, indicating that it's uh, getting towards the later stage and may be ready to begin to uh, slough. Yet another example. Um, again, very fragmented. Uh, and uh, looking at these glands, uh, you see there's really quite a lot of glandular substance here. 
um, seeing so many glands, sometimes people are inclined to say, well, this is a endometrial hyperplasia because we have an increased gland to stroma ratio. Um, and uh, that is a, a possible consideration, certainly enters the differential diagnosis. But remember also that uh, architectural changes and cytologic changes should be seen as well. And here we don't see any cytologic atypia. The glands are simply secretory glands, very closely spaced that have begun to be close, more closely spaced because the stroma is uh, losing its, uh, losing the edema as it were uh, that it had. And so they appear to become more closely spaced. Now here we actually have a few glands with residual um, uh, subnuclear vacuoles, uh, but this is not the dominant change in this particular case. So this may be on the sort of the waxing side of the uh, mid secretory uh, category because you still have a few residual um, subnuclear vacuoles. No pre decidua in this uh, particular uh, slide. And I believe we have one more example here. Um, again, a situation where, gee, it looks like there's a lot of glands down here um, and uh, they look kind of busy in some areas. The stroma is a little bit edematous. Um, but as we look at these uh, glands, uh, we see secretion. Uh, we do not see um, really any evidence that there is a cytologic atypia between uh, different areas of the uh, sample. So even though these glands appear clustered and the NC ratio is high, you can resist making the diagnosis of endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, other than the physiologic hyperplasia that uh, happens in the normal menstrual cycle. So the late secretory phase, as I've mentioned, uh, these glands continue to have uh, these sort of, sort of played out appearance. They sort of spent their energy to produce the secretion uh, and the cells become uh, less prominent or less smaller. Uh, the pre-decidualized stroma appears around the spiral arterioles, and you may begin to see even early neutrophilic infiltration around these arterioles uh, or in the subsurface. Um, occasionally, you'll begin to see surface syncytial changes uh, as the stroma begins to collapse. The, the surface lining cells seem to shrink uh, around it or become uh, syncytial uh, knots of cells uh, associated with that uh, tissue. Uh, so here's a, a case, a lot of blood here. We may think, well, maybe this is early menstrual. Um, and of course, the distinction is uh, purely artificial on our part. Uh, but here you can see we still have these coiled glands, uh, sort of played out appearance, a lot of secretion still remaining. Um, so secretory phase, but notice the spiral arterial is becoming a little bit more prominent. I think we found another area here over here where we're beginning to see the pre decidua uh, that's coming into place as uh, in the subsurface as these cells acquire, the stromal cells acquire a bit more cytoplasm and have a pinker hue um, and accentuate the, this area. Uh, So a nice view of that pre decidua uh, in this uh, sample here. And again, it starts around these small vessels and underneath the uh, surface of the helium. Well, of course, that leads then to a menstrual phase where the glands and stroma fragment or condense more fully. Uh, you see these stromal balls, uh, which may have a thin uh, surface epithelial lining around them, very blue central cores and uh, lining of uh, uh, surrounding epithelial cells. You may see some microthrombi. Uh, 
um, and then the surface incisional change along with lots of hemorrhage in the background. Typically, uh, we don't get a lot of biopsies from the menstrual stage. Uh, so I actually had to struggle a little bit to come up with a good sample for you. Um, but we do see circumstances where we get uh, uh, sort of menstrual light changes. Of course, blood is one clue, very fragmented glands um, with these uh, condensed stromal aggregates. And you may have fragments of uh, basalis that will show up along with that. Um, here's a nice example of one of these uh, little stromal balls here as you get uh, this very condensed core of uh, stroma with a surrounding cuff of uh, epithelium. Uh, here's another one, uh, more stromal balls here. Um, and uh, we should be able to find a few microthrombi in here as well. Again, here's more of these stromal balls condensing with surrounding uh, epithelial cells. So the stroma just begins to seemingly fall apart. Um, and then uh, here's a little bit of the sort of syncytial change that we uh, can see here. Here's some fibrin and thrombi associated with the sort of fibrin thrombi that we can, uh, can see as well. Here's the syncytial change um, as these cells sort of become multinucleated around these uh, little nests of stroma. Now, the important thing in this situation is to not mistake a menstrual endometrium for hyperplasia or for papillary uh, uh, carcinomas um, that are, have become hemorrhagic. We've got another slide here. Let's take a look at another example. Oh, I don't have that. All right, so um, another uh, common finding, uh, particularly because the age group that's most commonly biopsied is the perimenopausal age group, is what is termed a disordered proliferative pattern. Uh, this is a uh, distinct pattern, but has some overlap uh, and may have some continuity to uh, early hyperplasias, uh, but essentially you have tuber tubular glands that have some architectural abnormality, uh, so-called elbows and knees. Uh, they get angulated, they get a little budding and so forth. They probably will still be mitotically active. The stroma is compact, uh, but in general, the gland to stroma ratio is well below 50% and there's no cytologic atypia. So uh, here we see that, we see these sort of angulation, irregular contours, a little budding uh, off of one of them here, so-called elbow. Um, and you may see in this situation, uh, little microthrombi and areas of stromal breakdown because these are essentially uh, anovulatory cycles um, or altered hormonal responsiveness of the glands and stroma. So I've got several examples of this to illustrate these features. Um, now, much, much of this is a very atrophic pattern, as we see here, just very thin uh, strips and glands. Uh, but you can occasionally get fragments like this um, in that setting, where um, you, know, you get a little bit more proliferative appearing glands. They're funny looking but they're certainly not cytologically abnormal enough to call this a hyperplasia. So using the term disorder proliferative is a useful uh, sort of category for these situations, particularly if you see evidence that there is some degree of a um, proliferative pattern, as you see here, widely spaced glands, tubular shaped and so forth. Now the proliferation is generally gonna be very weak Minimal mitotic activity, if any, you can maybe see one suggestive mitosis there. 
Um, and so uh, uh, these very weakly stimulated uh, endometria uh, can appear this way. And in, in reality, if you were to call this an atrophic endometrium or an inactive endometrium, that would probably be fine too. Another example here of this uh, change. Um, here we see very compact stroma, um, but even at low magnification, you can see we've got some uh, dilated glands, uh, some irregularly shaped glands, uh, along with some maybe more conventional proliferative type of activity. So, um, seeing these sorts of abnormal contours, um, making the diagnosis of disordered proliferative endometrium can help to explain a cause for abnormal bleeding because as I mentioned, it indicates there's been anovulatory cycles. And here we see, for example, um, one of these areas where you get fibrin thrombi and early uh, breakdown of the surrounding stroma with associated hemorrhage in the interstitium. Um, but this is that disorder proliferative pattern. So uh, these glands wanted to get a secretory stimulus, but there just was no luteal spike uh, to provide the incentive or the uh, signal to make that uh, change. Uh, and we can see there are glandular mitoses here. Um, so it is a proliferative endometrium, but it's, uh, it's got this abnormal architecture um, and that's manifest by these uh, changes, these outward budding, um, compact coiling and so forth uh, that we see in these uh, situations. Now you could use other terms for this as well, anovulatory, proliferative, or something of that sort. But I think the broader convention is to use the term disordered proliferative uh, for this pattern. Another example, uh, and I give you several examples of this because this is a challenging uh, diagnosis uh, to really get right and dis to distinguish from uh, hyperplasias, which uh, are uh, also in and of themselves a little bit challenging, but I'll include some uh, clear-cut hyperplasias as sort of the appendix on the presentation and do a, a later presentation as well uh, on that specific topic. Uh, but here you see, again, this sort of abnormal uh, pattern of glands that, that, that aren't tubular. They're sort of, you know, sort of wavy, heavy sort of patterns. Uh, occasionally, you get these thromb thrombi here we see. Uh, so this is sort of an anovulatory appearance that has just uh, exceeded its ability to sustain itself uh, and is trying to, is going to break down and slough and cause abnormal bleeding, uh, raising concern and so forth, and leading to this biopsy. Now, very often, uh, this, uh, as I mentioned, can begin to overlap with um, endometrial hyperplasias and or EIN, as it's called sometimes. Um, and so an area like this, where you see, um, uh, you know, more closely spaced glands and stroma would raise concern for that, as well as uh, these areas of uh, intraluminal neutrophilia, particularly if, as in this case, we see uh, a degree of cytologic atypia uh, and uh, sort of stratification that differs from what we were looking at as the more conventional uh, uh, finding over here. If this is our normal baseline endometrial gland, uh, then this appearance that we were just seeing um, there uh, would represent an altered uh, appearance of those endometrial glands. And you can see, compare them close by here and see, okay, I see the difference here. This is no longer just disordered proliferative. This has become uh, intraepithelial neoplasia, uh, 
if it meets the uh, glandostromal criteria and the size criteria that we have uh, of being greater than two millimeters. Uh, probably this is kind of on the borderline um, in that category, but I think uh, would uh, merit that uh, consideration. So you see there the overlap and the uh, distinction between uh, those two, and it's nice to have them kind of both here on this same slide. Of course, the uh, etiologic factors uh, for, for this may be uh, similar uh, for both entities, and in that there may be unopposed estrogen uh, that can lead to hyperplasia and probably is associated with a disordered proliferative pattern as well as many of these represent kind of un anovulatory cycles. So here's another uh, endometrium, very compact stroma. And here we can see this funny altered looking glandular architecture compared with the more normal tubular pattern that we have in some of these other fragments. So this could be present in a polyp uh, or it could be an area within the endometrium that's showing a uh, differential response to the hormone and producing um, an, a disordered pattern. Again, little microthrombi indicating areas of stromal breakdown. I often use uh, enlarged vessels as a marker for endometrial polyps. Uh, sometimes you can see those, and so this may be uh, related to a polyp, although these are relatively small vessels still and could just be basalis. Again, note the uh, microthrombi associated with the uh, stromal breakdown and shedding. And uh, one more um, lesion. Um, here again, we see this altered architecture. Here we see very prominent vessels, um, uh, I think indicating that we are in a polyp. Uh, again, more vessels here and here and here and here. So certainly looking very much like a polyp. And uh, notice the abnormal contours to these uh, glands. Uh, irregular shapes, branches, indentations, outpouchings, and so forth. Um, and again, you can study these and see and identify the, the mitotic activity that's uh, still ongoing. Now, if I don't uh, look uh, at the high magnification to identify or I don't see mitotic figures, I will sometimes, uh, rather than use just the term uh, disordered proliferative endometrium, I'll use the term disordered proliferative pattern endometrium, meaning that uh, we have the, uh, the morphologic pattern of disordered uh, disarray, but we may not necessarily have the uh, uh, diagnostic mitotic activity. And uh, one additional example here, again, to give you more of this exposure on what the spectrum of uh, this uh, disorder can be. So here we'll see, you know, nice gland to stroma ratio, but look at the abnormal contours of this gland here. You know, it's sort of angled and bunched up and indented. Here's one of these sort of knees bulging out from the gland. Uh, these are the, uh, the terms that uh, uh, give us this uh, disordered appearance. Um, now the glands are not very proliferative. There's not very many uh, mitotic figures. You might see one here, uh, maybe another one down here. Um, And uh, in this situation, we're not seeing any of the glandular crowding or condensation of stroma that uh, would suggest a polyp or a uh, uh, hyperplasia. So again, disordered proliferative pattern endometrium seems to be a good term for these situations. Another term that I use uh, is so-called inactive pattern. Um, and this is uh, what's been likened to the endometrial basalis, sort of the uh, pre-proliferative stage. Um, but it can also occur in other settings, such as when you have uh, chronic endometritis, uh, 
that essentially arrests the uh, growth uh, of these. Uh, these uh, glands tend to be tubular, maybe slightly angled, and generally there's no longer any mitotic activity. But the cells have not uh, become atrophic uh, or uh, lost their cytoplasm or their apparent capability. It just looks like the switch was turned off and they have no longer been uh, proliferative. So here's uh, one example, um, not so much of this uh, activity, uh, because I think here we actually do have a little bit of mitotic activity, uh, but I, I put this slide in uh, to illustrate um, this feature that we do have a few mitoses in this uh, tissue. We also have a uh, few subnuclear vacuoles. Um, and as we go over here to the uh, nice ink dot, uh, we begin to see some clusters of uh, lymphocytes. Here may be a little bit of a sloughing fragment. And pull in here a really high magnification here and let it depixelate because uh, what we've marked here, and I'm not sure if this is going to project very well, um, is the presence of a plasma cell in the stroma. Right here, you see the eccentric nuclei and the perinuclear Hoff. So uh, in general, uh, identification, unequivocal identification of one plasma cell uh, in the uh, stroma uh, qualifies as a chronic endometritis. Um, typically, you do not see ongoing mitotic activity in that circumstance uh, if it's very well established. But obviously here we have a plasma cell we have uh, mitotic figures in the immediately adjacent glands, so that little dictum uh, no longer holds. Uh, but uh, uh, looking for plasma cells when you see lymphoid aggregates or when you see an inactive pattern that just doesn't seem to fit, uh, when you see uh, situations like this where some are proliferative, some are secretory, uh, maybe asynchronous, uh, looking and considering chronic endometritis is also uh, worth uh, considering. And then finally, an atrophic pattern. Uh, this is usually uh, several years postmenopause. Um, and in this situation, the cells appear very shrunken, very small. There is no cytologic atypia. If you see a biopsy, you may have some cystic changes like this, so-called cystic atrophy. Um, and the stroma can be either very compact or it can appear somewhat hypocellular and pink, uh, almost fibrotic. Um, typically on curatage and biopsy, you get very little or no stroma in these circumstances. The samples are almost always very uh, scant. Um, and as you look at them, uh, you'll see just these long chains of epithelial cells, maybe with a little bit of a stromal fragment or component that's sort of compressed and so forth. But this is a very nice, very typical pattern for an atrophic endometrium with uh, essentially just these very long chains, single strips of uh, epithelium, maybe a little bit of condensed stroma. And usually the uh, gynecologist has to scrape pretty hard to even get that much. Here's another example uh, of this uh, circumstance. Um, again, very scant sample. Uh, a few glands and stroma with a slight bit of cystic change. Um, very small cells. Condensed stroma, no evidence of mitotic activity or atypia. Now you do have to be aware in these circumstances that uh, atrophic endometria, particularly if there's a polyp involved, can be the setting for uh, serous carcinomas, which may uh, be, uh, that do not arise in a hyperhormonally stimulated pattern. And so being alert to look for those occasional nests of uh, 
atypical papillary epithelium is important. But I think you see here this nice uh, appearance of the very thin atrophic epithelium and uh, benign stroma. Now, another uh, feature that's commonly identified is the exogenous hormonal effect. Um, we see this because patients uh, who have uh, postmenopausal, perimenopausal bleeding will often be uh, given uh, progestins as a uh, temporizing matter so that they can staunch the bleeding until they can come in for a biopsy. Um, in this situation where the hormone is exogenous, these glands will be quite shrunken or very atrophic appearing, while the stroma becomes very accentuated with these decidualized cells that are very plump and pink. So here's an example uh, of this. We see a moderate amount of uh, tissue. Um, and as we look at this, we can see the, the stroma is predominating, uh, a lot of stroma, it's fairly pink, um, and the glands tend to be fairly shrunken and small. So this is a, consistent with a decidualized endometrium with exogenous hormone effect. Uh, now, depending on the duration of treatment, the sh shrunken glands may be uh, more or less prominent. Now, because uh, uh, these patients are bleeding, you may also find some menstrual type changes, such as you see here, with very condensed stroma, fragmented, uh, sort of breaking down. Um, it's also important to note that this uh, can be, uh, uh, these, these patients can be seen in follow-up for uh, endometrial adenocarcinomas of low grade that they're trying to treat medically rather than uh, surgically when the patient is a uh, higher surgical risk. And so in some settings, low-grade cancers can be treated with exogenous progestin agents. Um, and so looking to see that you don't have uh, glandular proliferation or atypia um, can be very important in that setting to exclude uh, residual uh, disease. Of course, typically you should have that history provided to help you help guide you in that. So here's another example of a nice decidualized endometrium. In this case, the patient had been had a little bit longer course of therapy, and you see the glands here have almost entirely disappeared. Uh, here's one little gland here, another one here. You see they're just very tiny pinpoints, um, and the stroma is a pale pink, somewhat edematous uh, pattern stroma uh, with uh, virtually no identifiable residual glands, just these little tiny pinpoints here. Let's just see. Well, thank you so much for walking through these. Uh, I welcome you to come back and look over this digital slides. Uh, there's uh, going to be some uh, bonus slides towards the uh, end of the presentation to allow you to look at EIN. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, future topics in uh, both gynecologic and other areas of uh, surgical pathology. I appreciate you uh, joining me for this session and hope that this has been helpful to you uh, in gaining a basic understanding of uh, what to look for in endometrial biopsies uh, that uh, uh, come frequently across our desk uh, because this uh, Vaginal bleeding is a very common symptom, and uh, usually that is worked up by uh, getting a biopsy. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.